In our second reading today, St. Paul talks about being someone who experienced living in abundance and someone living in need. Paul was the most renowned rabbi of his day. His reputation spread from Rome all the way down to throughout the Holy Lands. He was the most learned and scholarly person in regard to the law. And because of that, he also was rather wealthy. A rabbi is someone who actually makes good money. Uh, I know uh, at one time I was doing a joint wedding for a friend of mine. He was marrying a Jewish lady. And we had this joint celebration uh, with <clears throat> a rabbi from Newark, New Jersey. And the wedding took place uh, in the DuPont uh, Country Club, uh, which is rather costly. And the rabbi at one point asked me, he goes, so um, what do priests get for doing a wedding? I said, well, because this is a good friend of mine, this is gratis, I don't, I won't take anything from him. He goes, what? So I go, all right, what do you get? He goes, 10%. I said, 10%? He goes, yeah, the bill of the reception, I get 10% of what that bill is. When I know that it was close to 300 people and it had to be $150 a head for the spread that they had, I was thinking, wow, <laughs> no wonder he came all the way down from Newark. But so I, I, you know, when, when Paul's saying that he had this life of abundance, and then as he encountered Christ on his way, uh, looking to persecute the church, uh, he, on the way, road to Damascus, he sets aside his whole way of life, and he learns to live for three years in need. He, indeed, go, becomes baptized. And by accepting Christ as his savior, he then began to be someone who proclaimed the good news, who sought responsibility for what he came to understand in regard to the promise of everlasting life, which he was to proclaim to everyone, to all the Gentiles. Paul indeed was accepted by the church, and as we know, was made an apostle which means he celebrated the Eucharist besides just going around you know, being an itinerant preacher. So he established churches throughout, and today he's talking to uh, the Philippians who understand him as a person who was in need, as someone who was you know, belittled, stoned, and desperate, and they took him in and they saw to his needs. And he says to them, I fear nothing because my strength now comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. And that strength comes through the grace of the sacraments. And he says, so glory to our Lord Jesus Christ and gives him proper praise. But he also thanks the people for their kindness. When we think about our situation in life here, we need to understand that whether we think we're rich or not, we live a life of abundance. If you have a house, a car, and a TV, you live in the top 2% of people throughout the whole world. That's, that's a truth. And yet we fail to see that and understand that at times. But that's not just talking about, you know, having a life of abundance here on earth. We gather today for the celebration of what is eternal and that which we aspire to. And that's why our prophet, in our first reading, Isaiah, 
you know, it, it, the Lord says through Isaiah, this is what I shall do on this mountain. I will establish this incredible feast. And at this feast, the finest wines and the finest foods will be provided for all the people. And those who are <clears throat> uh, even sinful, will, that veil will be lifted from them, the, the, the veil of death and the, you know, the effects of sin. And they will be able to see God face to face on this holy mountain, on Mount Zion, in Jerusalem. He's talking about the new eternal Jerusalem. But he's also alluding to the fact that Jesus Christ will indeed remove the veil. You think about when Jesus in the crucifixion scene, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two. That's what he's alluding to. And he's alluding to this banquet that we celebrate here. For not we're, what we receive here, which is in space and time, is just the foreshadowing of the ultimate and the perfect Paschal celebration in heaven. And just as we hear of Isaiah's first you know, presentation of that Paschal <clears throat> banquet where all glory is given to God, so too do we hear Jesus' explanation of that eternal banquet in his gospel. And he talks about a king sending out you know, servants, i.e., if you want to do this allegorically, the prophets of old, and help, tells them to invite the people to the banquet of eternal life, and, well, some don't bother coming. Some goes back to their farms and do what they want to do and make their life here on earth what is most important instead of seeking eternity with God. So, what does he do? Well, he has the city burned down. Think about Jerusalem burning in the year 70. Again, being prophetic. He then goes ahead and sends others, his apostles, and he invites them to this banquet, and whereby his son is betrothed to his church, to the body of Christ. And the celebration, which is meant to be eternal, is thereby rounded up, and we are called by all kinds of people, whether Gentile or Jew, we're all invited to this banquet but we need to accept the responsibility of that call. So as we hear how it, at the, it being invited to this banquet, the king comes in and sees this man not in a wedding garment. He has the person removed. My question to you, what do you think that wedding garment stands for? Very good. It's actually, it's indicative of our baptism and the fact that our souls have been purified by God. That this is something we accepted as Jesus as being our Savior and that we chose a different way of life. Not of a life of abundance that we want, but more importantly, living for others. When we take on our baptism, by the way, we, when we fail to see baptisms as they once were celebrated, uh, did anybody see the... Uh, the Godfather. Do you remember the baptism scene? Not the violence going on on the backside, but the actual baptism scene. You see what happens. You see the white vestment and everything that's there provided. You see how the priest would take wine and give it to the child and then salt because he's going to be the salt of the earth and he's going to be called to be a disciple and proclaim the good news. All this being said, all right, as he's baptized, and made a new person in Christ, and bestowed with the light of the, uh, of the Paschal candle, and given newness of life, he now has changed. People spend, okay, time and effort from the time, especially women with, I know, my, you know, from the time that you're aware that you have a child, you're already putting into plans baptism. 
the baptismal garment, whether it's the, the one handed down through tradition or whether there's going to be one made. Uh, we, all those things are set up ahead of time. The parents and the godparents would go to classes to understand exactly what their role is and how they're called to live a life of baptism, an exemplary life for their children, how they will help their children understand the Eucharist and come to share that. Oh, by the way, we had, was set, Pat, 17 people 17 first communities yesterday? 11, oh, okay, 14 and then. So we had 25 kids celebrate the Eucharist. And guess what? They've been waiting since April, okay? But they've been learning about the Eucharist for two years, not through just the religious education programs, but through their family. They plan this for these days in such a way that they're all dressed up. Don't you remember all being dressed up for your first communion? I have a picture, but I showed it to you before. You know, it's something you took to heart, that you prepared for, that you took seriously, that that, that garment, that, that white garment, you still wear white at first communion. You wear white when you become a priest. You wear white when you're married. It's acknowledging that you live a life of Christ indicative of a pure soul because Jesus suffered and died for us. He has removed the sin. He has removed the veil of death. We walk in verdant pastures. He leads us through the valley of death as we heard in our responsorial psalm today to celebrate all eternity in heaven. I will live all the days of my life in the house of the Lord. What we share in is not something that's just here or ordinary. It's extraordinary. And if we just go through the motions, if we're not accepting Jesus, you know, as one who forgives us of our sins, then we're missing the boat. It's like we're not wearing the garment. It's not acknowledging who we are. Do you realize at this point in time, even counting those people who are live streaming at home, the number of Catholics that are going to Mass well, because of the pandemic, but also because many have been asked, but few have been chosen to be and celebrate their faith. 17% of all Catholics participate at Mass. It's mind-boggling. We fail to appreciate what God has provided for us that he gives us his body and his blood, real food, real drink. He provides for the remission of sins if we go to the sacrament of penance. But we fail to go to the sacrament of penance. We don't prepare for the celebration as we ought. My sisters would be able to tell you, each and every Saturday growing up, didn't matter if you're in the ball, middle of a game on the ball field, you, get in the car. That's on Saturday, going, and before you went to confession, every Saturday, before we went to mass on Sunday. That'd be, that's unheard of today. How many people took the time to fast this morning before they celebrated the Eucharist? These are things in which way we make this the most special thing. That this is the most aspired thing in our life. That this is the means of receiving God's grace in such a way that we become the salt of the earth where we're sent out to go the out byways and the back streets and invite people to share in the celebration. We become the ones who are called, as preached prophet and king from our baptism, to tell the people to come to the banquet of everlasting life. When we fail to see the importance of accepting Christ's forgiveness when we no longer think that we need it, we're fooling ourselves. That wedding garment is constantly renewing our soul. It's constantly accepting Jesus' mercy. For not so much the things we do horribly wrong, that too, but more importantly, the fa things we fail to do where we're so preoccupied by our businesses or our lives here on earth that we forget we're more inclined to the farm as we hear uh, in that gospel reading or more inclined to our businesses and the cares of this world and trying to live a life of abundance here 
instead of preparing ourselves for the greatest gift that God has ever given. Celebrate the Eucharist with pureness of heart. Celebrate the gift of everlasting life. And you will live in the house of the Lord all the days of your life.